Hi, and welcome back to another recomp video. First of all, let's note that there have been a few changes since I was here last. The parameter scaling has changed for a start, so it's now much easier to dial in low ratios. Or fast attacks. Or very small RMS sizes. This is definitely an improvement, so big thanks to the developers for that. Other changes. We now have a pre-fader feedback option. The old version is still there for backwards compatibility, but the new version takes the signal from before the output level faders, so adjusting the gain or mixing in the dry signal will no longer affect the amount of compression. However, the effective ratio still drops, and you still can't use the auxiliary inputs at the same time, so the tricks I'm going to show you today are still relevant. Final change, the non-working oversampling options are now hidden, unless they're actually enabled in the preset you're using. I know a few people on the forum are disappointed that they're only hidden, not fixed, but personally I'm happy to wait for them to be implemented properly with steeper filters. So let's get down to business. Here's where we left off last time, with two recomps in series for my 1176 hack. The first is running in feedback mode, with the ratio all the way up, giving us an effective 2 to 1 ratio. And the second is in feed forward mode, meaning that, crucially, its sidechain is hearing the same signal as the sidechain for the first compressor. With a 2 to 1 ratio, it's just doing the last little bit of gain reduction required to make an overall 4 to 1 ratio. The issues we had with this setup are the dry fader doesn't work properly, as of course the signal under this fader is the output of the first compressor rather than the dry signal. And we can't use the auxiliary inputs, so we can't do things like sidechain EQ. Another issue I didn't mention last time is the gain reduction metering. With the gain reduction split between the two compressors, you really need to see both meters to get a proper idea of the overall gain reduction you're applying. Although we can link the threshold sliders, if you interact with just the second compressor, you won't get an accurate picture of the actual gain reduction at all. So let's fix all those issues with the fake feedback trick. I'll start by opening the routing window for the first compressor. And I'll add another pair of audio channels to the track. And reroute the output of the compressor to channels 3 and 4. Just so that I remember what's going on, I'm going to rename this compressor SC Precomp. Now the second compressor needs its detector input switching to the auxiliary inputs, which are by default already connected to channels 3 and 4. So the second compressor is still listening to the output of the first compressor as it was. But the actual signal that we're listening to now only passes through the second compressor. Here's how this routing looks in a graphic modular host, in case that helps you to visualise it better. So now, if I turn the ratio all the way up for the main compressor, it behaves just like the sidechain compressor, giving us feedback-style compression. And if I switch to actual feedback compression, sure enough, it sounds just the same. But if 
if I turn down the ratio all the way for the side chain pre-compressor, it's now not doing anything. So the auxiliary input signal for the main compressor is now the same as the main input, and we have feed forward compression. Just the same as if I switched to the main inputs. So I can use the side chain pre-compressor's ratio slider to go from feed forward compression with an infinite ratio to feedback compression with an effective 2 to 1 ratio or anywhere in between. Notice that as I turn up the ratio that grabby feed forward character disappears quite quickly. There's the feed-forward sound. But by the time I get up to about 1.7 to 1, it sounds like feedback compression again. And this setting leaves the main compressor squashing the signal with an effective ratio of about 4 to 1. So the big advantages of this setup. The dry fader on the main compressor actually gives us dry signal, so parallel compression works properly. That's because this is now the only compressor in the actual signal path. So this also fixes the gain reduction metering problem, and this meter accurately shows the actual gain reduction we're applying. And we can have side chain EQ. Let's pull in a re-EQ. We need this at the beginning of the chain. I'll rename it SCEQ. And we need to tweak the routing. I'll keep the inputs coming from 1 and 2, but redirect the outputs to channels 3 and 4. Now I need to tweak the side chain pre-compressor routing. We don't need the auxiliary inputs, but we want the main inputs to come from channels 3 and 4, which is the output of the EQ. And now I can EQ the side chain of my compressors. Here's how this routing looks in a graphic modular environment. So what we have now is the fake feedback trick. But the fabulous part is yet to come. Because we don't necessarily have to have these compressors set the same. Let's think about what's going to happen if the side chain pre-compressor is set with a faster attack than the main compressor. Now the transients are being smashed off the side chain signal, so the main compressor is hearing less of them, and therefore doesn't react as much. And notice how the compression has relaxed around those transients and stopped grabbing them so hard. Conversely, if the attack is slower, so you shape the side chain transients to be punchier or thumpier, the main compressor will react more aggressively. Like so. Let's AB those differences. And likewise, though to a slightly lesser extent, we can tweak the release behaviour as well. If the release for the sidechain is faster than the main compressor, the sidechain signal will rush back up in level quicker, which might make the main compressor release a bit less aggressively.
And conversely, if the release is slower for the sidechain, the sidechain level will be held down for longer after each hit. So the main compressor might release more aggressively as a result. Let's AB those as well. So balancing the attack and release times for the two compressors can achieve a wide range of different compression styles. I could back off the attack for the main compressor for a punchier sound. Then slow down the side chain attack even further to exaggerate that punchy character and make it more extreme. And likewise, I'll set the sidechain release slower than the main release to get more aggressive release behaviour from the main compressor. And this gives me a bouncy, punchy compression sound with bags of character. There's the bypass. Now, I may have given the impression so far that Recomp can be made to sound like any other compressor and is the only one you really need. However, while testing with a drum loop can be revealing, it doesn't tell the whole story. Let's try something completely different. Here's a Little Robots song, which I recently used for a fab filter tutorial. I'm compressing it with a fairly firm 4 to 1 ratio, but I've softened that with quite a large knee so I'm probably not driving it hard enough to actually reach that ratio. I've set a fairly relaxed attack time to let the guitar transients through. But I'm struggling with the release. The default release setting sounds a bit pumpy. So let's try a bit slower. And by the time it stops pumping, I've also lost any gluing effect. So let's try going the other way with a faster release. And now it's too fast. We're losing the dynamic shape of the music. So I end up back more or less where I started, but I'm still hearing the compression too much. I'm not going to fight this. Let's rewind and try a different compressor instead. And this sounds pretty good straight away. He carries heavy loads. Mm. He it's 
gluing nicely, but it's not pumping. And it's much more transparent than Recomp. So how come I had to work so hard to dial in Recomp, but a free compressor with no attack and release controls can just nail it straight away? Part of the reason might be program dependency, which simply means the compressor reacts differently depending on the input signal. This could mean faster attack or release times when presented with a short transient, or slower release times after prolonged gain reduction, or slower behaviour for low frequency content than for high frequency content, or an infinite number of other variations. This makes program dependency quite tricky to test for, so there's really no substitute for listening to how the compressor reacts with different types of material. But there may be a more fundamental reason why this Klanghelm compressor sounds more transparent than Recomp, which I can demonstrate in Plugin Doctor. Let's switch to the Dynamics tab, and I'll choose the Attack Release mode. This presents the plugin with a special test signal. A sine wave starts at a low level, then jumps suddenly to a higher level, before dropping back to the lower level again. So if I set the compressor to catch the loud part, we can now see how the attack shapes the leading edge of the loud section. And we can also see how the gain recovers during the release stage after the level drops again. Let's zoom in on that release section. And notice the shape. It's almost a straight line, but with a slight upward curve, implying that the gain starts to recover more slowly at first, but speeds up slightly towards the end. This shape stays consistent regardless of the release time I set. Interestingly, if I set the release to zero, and introduce RMS smoothing instead, we see a much more extreme version of that upward curve, with the release starting slowly, then rushing back up at the end. If I set the RMS window to a more normal size, and likewise the release, I can introduce a slight pause before the main release stage takes over. Interestingly, the Klanghelm compressor also appears to have a slight pause before the release stage kicks in. But after that, the shape looks quite different, curving in the opposite direction. So the gain starts to recover quickly at first, then slows down at the end as we approach unity. OK, let's have a look at FabFilter Pro C2 using the punch style. No initial pause here. We're straight into fast release, which then slows down towards the end. Here's the FabFilter Clean style, which looks very similar. And as I look through my compressor folder, I find this type of shape and variations of it keep cropping up, even from radically different types of compressors with different intended applications. This type of shape is generally considered to be more transparent than the opposite curve, as the majority of the gain change closely follows the loud event that triggered the gain reduction, and so gets masked by that event, and we don't notice it so much. But while this type of shape is popular, it's by no means universal. Here's the FabFilter Mastering Style, which has a magical ability to make your mix sound exactly the same, except a little bit better. And this looks very similar to the Klanghelm DC1A response we looked at earlier. Perhaps this subtle S-shape helps to create compression that works well with full mixes. 
A note of caution, however. I know for a fact that all the fab filter compression styles are program dependent. And I don't know, but I'm guessing that the mastering style is highly program dependent, judging by how hard it is to make it sound bad. So we have to consider the possibility that this shape we're seeing is purely a response to this rather unnatural test signal and wouldn't occur when processing a full mix. One thing we can safely conclude is no two compressors behave the same way. Note that I'm changing the graph scale or the release times on the compressors so that we can see the whole release stage clearly. So the differences are actually even greater than they appear. Some compressors create visibly asymmetric waveforms during the release stage, suggesting they'll be adding strong, even harmonics, which seems to check out when I switch to a harmonic analysis. And while there is a general trend to start releasing faster, then slow down, this is by no means universal. I found some which look more linear, a few with upward curves, like Recomp or more so, and some that just look weird. But let's take a moment to think about what linear actually means in the context of a compressor release. For the purpose of this demonstration, I've hacked together a JS compressor with unusual behavior. This compressor has linear attack and release stages when measured on a decibel scale. When it's attacking, the gain is reduced at the rate set by the attack slider, calibrated in dB per millisecond. And when it's releasing, the gain increases at the rate set by the release slider, calibrated in dB per second, with absolutely no program dependency at all. This means the attack and release parameters work backwards, like in 1176, so you turn them up to make them faster. And unlike most other compressors, the attack and release values displayed are actually 100% accurate. The downside is no one has any idea what 3 dB per millisecond means in musical terms, as we're all used to compressors calibrated in milliseconds instead. And linear compressors don't tend to sound that good. The attack in particular is very hard to dial in. Notice how it just suddenly starts to ignore the transients completely when set too slow. The release can sound pretty good with fast, aggressive settings but gets very pumpy with medium settings and quite suddenly gets way too slow to recover between hits. If we examine this release behavior back in Plugin Doctor, we see that it doesn't look linear at all, as we're looking at the amplitude of the waveform rather than a decibel scale. In fact, True linear behavior from a compressor gives us a pronounced upward curve. So if a compressor generates a straight line, or if it gets closer to a straight line than my linear compressor, like Recomp, this means that it's actually releasing faster at the start than at the end, when measured in terms of dB per second. Just not as much as other designs that create this type of curve. So what I'm trying to say is, Recomp can't possibly recreate all the subtle or not so subtle differences between compressors, and probably isn't going to be the only compressor you need. If at some point in the future, Recomp grows a tick box option to change the release curve to a shape more like this one, it will probably make it 400% more useful. But it still won't be the only compressor you need. The Fab Filter compressor gets a lot closer to that goal. It's full featured, so if you need a range control, or stereo linking options, or sidechain filtering, you're well covered. It's CPU efficient enough to go on every channel as a track compressor, but it's also great for buses and full mixes. And each style behaves like a totally different compressor. However, even if every other possible type of compressor was provided as a style option, the interface remains the same differences in interface are surprisingly important. A different control set, or even just different parameter scaling, can lead you to settings you might not otherwise have tried. And sometimes a reduced set of controls helps you to work quicker and avoid being paralyzed by too many options. Basically, you can't have too many compressors. If one isn't giving you the results you want, don't fight it. Try a different one instead. 
I keep some compressors just for one or two things they do well. For example, Audio Damage Rough Rider is great for adding punch to a weak, flabby floor tom. And I keep it in my folder just for those occasions. Recomp does a few things really well, which would earn it a place in my compressors folder if it wasn't there by default. But if I want transparent compression or subtle glue, I'll use something else. This should be considered an observation rather than a criticism. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.